Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food podcast, an educational series produced by the World Food Policy Center at Duke University. I'm Deborah Hill. You're listening to a segment in our Voice of Farming series. Tobacco has long been North Carolina's largest cash crop, but today there are only around 2,000 tobacco farms in the state. Tobacco smoking in the U.S. has been steadily declining, and the 2004 tobacco buyout ended federal tobacco marketing quota and price support loan payments. In recent years, about 75% of the tobacco grown in the state was exported abroad, much of it to China. This has come to a dramatic stop in the wake of the China-U.S. trade war. Farmers understand that fair trade doesn't come without a price, but many North Carolina farms are feeling the impact deeply. To ease the impact of the tariff war on U.S. farmers, the Trump administration made $12 billion in payments to help farmers who have lost sales. But, because of its health stigma, tobacco was excluded from the support. Today I'm talking with tobacco and hemp farmer Brandon Batten of Triple B Farms in Four Oaks, North Carolina. Right now, we're in a, you know, just over a year, I guess, into the trade war with China, and China is our biggest customer. Uh, especially for our tobacco, you know, 80%, 90% of the tobacco we grow goes to China on our farm and, and other crops too, but we have really good, uh, re- really well-drained soils for tobacco and sweet potatoes and some other crops, but they're not as good at producing corn and soybeans because they kind of they kind of require different environments. With the tobacco on the trade war, China didn't buy any tobacco in 2018 from the U.S. They're not buying any in 2019. And with that being our primary market, our contracts have seen a lot of downward pressure. Um, our volumes have been cut significantly. And, you know, who knows when this thing will be resolved. Um, other commodities have seen similar downward pressure on prices. Some of the markets that we're losing have taken generations to build and have basically been lost, you know, in a year. And they may come back or they may not. So, you know, that's kind of a, one of those things that keeps you awake at night, worrying about the future. Um, especially for, you know, not just now for me for the next year, next five years, but what about the next generation? Tobacco has been on our operation a long time. Uh, It's been a a huge part of North Carolina. It's built a lot of colleges and churches and and a lot of, paid for a lot of things, including my education. I think that as long as there's tobacco grown, I think it will be grown in eastern North Carolina because we have a kind of a perfect storm of climate, um, soils, and and conditions to make a really high quality, really premium um, flavor tobacco that can't be replicated anywhere else in the world um, because everybody can do it cheaper than we can, but nobody can do it as sustainably or as, as good as we can, at least not right now. Um, so I don't think, I think tobacco is definitely diminishing, definitely shrinking. Um, I don't think it's going to go away. You know, as long as it's legal, I think there'll be tobacco here just because it's perfectly suited environment for it. Um, as far as our operation, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, right now, that's, that's kind of the million dollar question. Um, and what's next if tobacco does leave? So, um, you know, we're certainly hopeful that, that tobacco will have a place on our farm, but I'm trying to reduce our dependence on it you know at every chance I get with other crops and through other ventures. So with tobacco since the um, the end of the government program in 2004 um, which was the the government price support program there was a buyout of that program and now tobacco is is a free commodity just like anything else anybody can plant it there's no quota or allotment per se from the government Um, But the companies today won't buy tobacco except from the year, you know, so in 2019 they buy tobacco grown in 2019. And if you have tobacco left over in 2020, they don't want it. So, you know, they can keep it for several years once it has been processed through some of the primary um, in their plants. But as far as farm level storage of tobacco, it it doesn't exist anymore. Um, There's no market for carryover tobacco from year to year. It's just one of the one of those things, um, but we're also in a in a very oversupplied market right now as well, so they don't have to buy it because they know they can get more in in the While year. While legalization of marijuana across the United States gets all the attention, there is a close cousin of the plant, hemp, 
which is having a moment. It's not the fiber of the plant, which can be used to make everything from t-shirts to tote bags, but the oil called CBD that can be pressed from the flower. Some farmers see industrial hemp as an opportunity to transition away from tobacco. Hemp is widely grown worldwide as a source of both fiber and oil seed. Harvesting equipment and dryers used for tobacco can also be used to harvest and cure hemp, allowing farmers to repurpose equipment they already own. North Carolina legalized hemp production in 2014 as part of a pilot program. Batten is one of the farmers producing industrial hemp as part of this program. So industrial hemp is a new crop we're trying. Um, I think this is the second or third year of the pilot program in North Carolina um, since it was legalized in the 2018 Farm Bill. But there's still a lot of controversy around hemp and there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty because right now there's basically no regulation as far as the selling of it. Um, we do have to get a license from the state and adhere to state testing standards to make sure that the THC level stays below 0.3 percent so that it is qualified as industrial hemp instead of marijuana because it's the exact same plant it's just uh, the chemical makeup's a little different than the marijuana that is still illegal. Um, but you know there's a lot of people coming out saying okay I'll buy your hemp and then a farmer will grow it and I've heard stories of them not getting paid. So that's a, that's a huge challenge to overcome. Um, there's also some legislative challenges, um, especially in North Carolina with people maybe not being as open and accepting to this new crop. You know, I've heard, I've heard hemp touted as the savior of the South or this will replace tobacco. And um, I'm not quite that optimistic yet. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that even, even around here in this rural area where I live that have, have admitted to using some CBD for different things. And, the CBD oil is helping them, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's physiological or psychological, but if it's helping them, who am I to say not use it? And the hemp we grow will be used to produce CBD oil. So, you know, I'm optimistic. Um, I'm not ready to bet the farm on it, but, um, you know, I, I, I tell people jokingly I was scared to death to try some, but I'm scared not to try it as well. So we'll see how it shakes out. Um, our hemp, I'm not sure what it's supposed to look like, but it looks really good to me. It's very robust. It work, seems to work well in our system that we have on the farm and our equipment and everything. Uh, so who knows? You know, I think it could be a, it could have a place on our farm in the future for sure, um, you know, if the marketing aspect of it goes well and the testing. So, Hemp looks and smells like marijuana, but can't get users high because it has very little of the chemical tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. There's a demand for hemp and cannabis oil, oil, also known as CBD, as a treatment for epilepsy and chronic pain. Hemp and extracts such as CBD can now be commercially produced, distributed, and sold in North Carolina, as long as the hemp plant and its products contain less than 0.3% THC. Um, I think with the, with the passing of the 2018 Farm Bill and the uh, um, kind of at the same time that the tobacco industry was in decline, it, it kind of was just a natural fit. Um, a lot of the same equipment we use in tobacco, we use in hemp, as far as the tillage equipment and the field equipment, as well as the drying barns. Um, hemp has to be dried after it's harvested, you know, not, not as long as tobacco, but the, the facilities are the same. So we haven't had to buy anything except the plants to, to kind of try the hemp. So that's, that was the appeal to us, and I think that's really the appeal for North Carolina is because we have the infrastructure to handle it. We have the equipment and the knowledge, so, you know, why not? And, and I'm glad that, that our, our legislators and that, that governing body of the Hemp Commission had the foresight to put this pilot program in there and lay the groundwork for North Carolina to be a possible industry leader in this crop. Um, you know, so along with industrial hemp, when you start talking about hemp for fiber, I think there's an opportunity for the textile industry that used to be so huge in North Carolina at possibly making a comeback you know it's almost like uh, which came first the chicken or the egg you know everybody says well there's no there's no hemp fiber plant so I'm not going to plant the hemp for fiber and then the plant people say well there's no hemp for fiber so we're not going to build a plant you know I think it's going to kind of take some collaboration um, in the industry to, to get this done and figure out how many acres are needed to support a plant per se and I've heard of some being built around you know in Kentucky and other places but I think there is certainly an opportunity for, you know, the fiber industry um, to make a comeback with, you know, the textile industry to make a comeback with the hemp fiber. 
just because it, it can be grown very well in North Carolina. One of the challenges of raising him is that markets and regulations are still in the early stages of development, and that translates into uncertainty for farmers. I mean, you know, industrial hemp is a huge investment. Um, compared to other crops we grow, you're talking about, you know, two or three times the cost per acre of, of money to put in the plants and the, and the work because it is a very labor-intensive crop. I mean, everything has to be done by hand still. Um, but, but likewise, right now, it's, it has the promise of a very high return. Um, but, you know, with the, the market for hemp, with everybody, you know, kind of jumping on this train, there's a lot of people that may not be as reliable as others as far as, as outlets, you know, selling points for my hemp. So um, we're contracted with a company that may not have the highest price, but I feel like has a reputation that they will at least, you know, have the money to pay me when I deliver the crop. Um, some other markets, you know, like tobacco, for example. Tobacco is not uh, allowed to be promoted by the government abroad. You know, U.S. tobacco, those markets have basically been created by farmers and by Commissioner of Agriculture and other people taking those trips to China and meeting with people and trying to get our foot in the door. Um, and, and now we've kind of lost that. So I really, you know, that's, that particularly hurts because I've been to foreign countries and sat in U.S. embassies and listen to their agriculture ambassador tell of all the great work they're doing promoting U.S. cotton and U.S. soybeans and U.S. corn and you ask them about tobacco and they won't even answer you because they're just not allowed to talk about tobacco abroad and you know that's kind of frustrating when you're already dealing with a luxury crop that that people don't have to have it's really a luxury and you're fighting with one hand behind tied behind your back to start with so um, you know I think hemp is an industry begging for a little bit of regulation just because there's so many people coming into this space and so many, uh, you know, it's been compared to the wild, wild west and I've kind of seen it. You know, there's a lot of different things, you know, rumors floating around and people coming to buy and just people see it and think you're growing marijuana, you know. So <laughs> there's a lot of education to be done, but um, it, it is a lot of work to develop this market. And I think North Carolina's positioned to be a leader in the hemp industry. Um, with the proper legislative support and the, you know, the proper market channels to get our crops sold. Thank you for listening. If you would like to subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food podcast series, you can do so at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcasts, or by visiting our website at the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Deborah Hill.